If I were to ask you what exactly is in your smartphone, what would you say? Me, I'd say 10,000 photos, 500 contacts, also truly an embarrassing number of videos of my cat. Sandra, what are you doing? But those are the things that make my smartphone mine. What makes it smart is metal. See, the average smartphone contains up to 62 different types of metals. And depending on your phone, between 8 and 16 of them are part of an obscure group known as rare earth metals, or rare earths. These are elements that mostly hang out at the bottom of the periodic table, with names like scandium and europium. But without them, smartphone displays wouldn't have such vivid colors. iPhone screens wouldn't have their signature polish. Honestly, your phone wouldn't even be able to vibrate. <laughs> there are 17 rare earths in the world, and they aren't just important for phones. You can find them in motors, aircraft engines, wind turbines, hard drives, and batteries. There are 55 pounds of rare earths in every Toyota Prius, 920 pounds in an F-35 fighter jet, and 9,000 pounds in a nuclear submarine. Not to mention, more than 90% of electric vehicles use motors with rare earth magnets. So it's safe to say every modern economy needs these metals, but only one country has a monopoly on the industry. In 2019, China processed 87% of the world's rare earths. Now, with more gadgets driving more demand, a lot of countries are wondering how they can get in the game. This is The Court's Obsession, a podcast that explores the fascinating backstories behind everyday ideas and what they tell us about the global economy. I'm your host, Kira Bindram. Today, rare earths and how the future of high-tech manufacturing hinges on just 17 metals. I'm joined now by Mary Hoy, who is in Hong Kong. It's 8 p.m. there, which means it's 8 a.m. where I am. So Mary is joining us from the future. Tell me, Mary, how is Hong Kong today? Yeah, so I'm in Hong Kong, and yes, it's the evening as we're recording this. I'm actually looking out on the Hong Kong skyline, and it's, yeah, dense kind of urban jungle look out of my window. Uh, But I would say my favorite part is probably the mountains. They're so close by, and I can always just pop out for a run on the trails to to recharge and and to, uh, to think about something else other than what's on my laptop. Speaking of things on your laptop, I am very curious to hear how you got interested in rare earths. So I kept seeing rare earths in headlines and stories and tweets, um, but I really couldn't quite grasp why they were so important or what really the scale of the complexity was. So I wanted to figure that out for myself and, and saw that as a good way to you know, look at the intersection of geopolitics and economics and business and a good dose of wonkiness, which really is kind of ultimate quartz. So that's where I got started, and um, I'm still looking at it now. I feel like we must be on very, very different Twitters if you are seeing rare earth tweets on the regular, because let me tell you, I am not. (laughs) What exactly are rare earths? Like, give us the sort of chemistry 101 here. It's really a group of 17 elements with quite similar chemical and physical properties. Sometimes they're referred to as industrial vitamins um, because small doses of rare earths can actually boost performance in a lot of technologies. And a lot of technologies actually wouldn't work very well without the rare earths. So what makes rare earths so special? Like why these 17 minerals? What's so unique about them? Yeah, it's really because rare earths have quite unique physical and chemical properties and, and four of them stand out. They're magnetic, so that makes them good candidates for batteries. It means that batteries can carry more energy um, per a given amount of weight. They're luminescent, i.e. glowy. Uh, They're electrical and they're catalytic. Why am I hearing about them now versus in the past? What's changed, if anything? Well, in large part, I think it's because the world has begun paying much more attention to critical material supply chains. 
Uh, we've seen how small disruptions in supply chains can really ripple throughout the global economy and cause humongous backlogs and snags. And so that's one reason. Another reason is because they have just become so much more necessary with high tech manufacturing and also with the energy transition as we move towards a more renewable um, energy economy. And a lot of these write offs will be needed for things like electric vehicles and wind turbines, which will be very key to getting carbon emissions down. So that's why I think rare earths are really quite at the forefront of um, the global conversation right now. Here's another probably dumb question. What is the process from getting a rare earth from a mine to my phone? Like, what is that whole uh, procedure? It's quite a long process. So you've mined it out of the ground, then you need to crush and grind and float what you've just dug up from the ground to increase the rare earth concentration by getting rid of some of the other stuff. And then you kind of crack it. Crack meaning you put it in a big oven and you crank up the temperature and then you leach it with water to flush out the impurities. And at this point, the solution is still mixed and it's in a liquid solution. So you've got to try and separate things. And there are different ways of separation, one being to precipitate it, which means that you can separate the individual elements out or in groups of elements. And then finally, you've got the pure rare earth metal or rare earth oxide. And this is finally sold to firms that need those things um, to make their rare earth magnets or their batteries, for example. Okay, so it's quite involved, it, it sounds like. Yes. For my little mining knowledge, <laughs> it sounds quite involved. And is this processing, like all of this other stuff that has to happen, is that primarily happening in the same place as, as the mine? Or is that just sort of fragments out into the rest of the world? So right now, processing happens mostly in China. China really has dominance over both the production of rare earths and the processing, and then also in the production of rare earth magnets. Sounds like they're a pretty important part of this whole equation. Give me a little intel on the, the magnet side of things. So rare earth magnets are magnets with rare earths in them. <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> much. more magnetic. Uh, the rare earths boost the performance of the magnets and uh, uh, makes them much more powerful magnets. And, and this is needed for things like uh, the motors in, in electric vehicles or the motors in um, wind turbines. So right now, the fact that China has dominance over such wide sections of the industry chain really has people quite worried about what that means. And the US uh, really wants to reestablish um, its own rare earth supply chains by mining its own rare earths and also making its own uh, magnets using rare earths. Okay, so we've established a baseline. China is the dominant player in terms of processing rare earths and also rare earth magnets. Why is that? Give me a little backstory on how China came to be such a dominant player in this industry. Well, China didn't used to be the biggest player or the biggest producer of rare earths, but they really got there by using targeted industrial policy in quite a successful way. We kind of start from, say, the 1980s when they used export tax rebates to encourage rare earth production. So producers were paid back their taxes by exporting rare earths. And then the government wanted to dial that back a little bit. Um, maybe it was getting unruly in the rare earths industry. So they wanted to kind of give it some shape. So in the 90s, they kind of jumped in. And instead of giving tax rebates to people, they would um, put export quotas to favor certain rare earths exports. They wanted rare earths that were processed to be uh, exported more than rare earths that were just sent out in their, in their raw form, just to get a bit more money out of those uh, products and, and to shift the industry away from that upstream raw and processed stuff to the more processed stuff. And then we have the 2000s, um, there's new overseas rare earths mining and processing outside of China. So the competition is ramping up. China gets a little concerned. So it dials up its domestic regulation. Um, and then the whole goal really is to make sure they can preserve uh, China's rare earth exports so that they're not being sold at these dirt cheap so-called cabbage prices below what they are actually valued at. How many rare earths companies are we talking about in China? So they decided to you know, really concentrate the industry around six major state-owned giants. And right now, those giants really make up the rare earth industry in, in China. They're the ones that hold the production quotas and the mining quotas. And then, of course, you have other kind of downstream players like magnet makers and battery makers. So what China is controlling when we say they're kind sort of controlling the supply chain is how much of these materials is being exported, at what price the material is being exported, and in what form the material is being exported. Is that right? I don't know if they're 
absolutely controlling the price. Actually, that's one of China's worries is that they don't have very much influence over the price at which uh, the rare earths are sold at. That's one of the weaknesses that the Chinese government thinks the rare earth industry has to deal with. Otherwise, they do want to try and, and shape the industry in, in the ways that you just described. So if you're China, you're thinking about the base supply that you have because of the deposits that just happen to be where you are. You're thinking about trying to uh, maintain some sort of control over how much of those supplies is exported in general, but also specifically as raw material versus in materials or in goods that China has already made. And you're trying to sort of exercise control at both ends of that supply chain, it sounds like. It's a lot to think about, I guess, is what I'm getting at here. Yeah. So they really do have to think about all these segments of the supply chain constantly. And, you know, for other players trying to catch up with China, the flip side holds true, right? Is that you really can't just start digging rare earths out of the ground and say, problem solved, we have uh, reduced our reliance on China. You have to make sure that there are companies in your country or elsewhere outside of China that will use those rare earths um, so that those rare earths aren't sold back to China to then help their own magnet makers and battery makers and the like. So it really is kind of a whole supply chain thing that people have to consider and make sure that all the pieces are kind of fitting together well. Is China dealing with any challenges here or, or is the only threat to China really the level of success these other countries have? China is unquestionably uh, still very dominant in the rare earth industry, but that's not to say that they don't have their own concerns. Um, China is overly uh, reliant on kind of the mining and the processing part of the supply chain and not as strong in coming up with kind of innovative new uses of rare earths or coming up with the latest inventions or the science for batteries and, and magnets. So they really want to work on that part of the supply chain. After the break, what rare earths are doing to the planet. Okay, so I, re- I want to pivot a little bit. I feel like it would be stupid of me not to ask you about the environmental impact of all of this. What is the environmental impact of rare earths mining and processing? The rare earth miners and the rare earth industry in general, they really want to position themselves as these green players who are really key to the energy revolution. And, and that's quite true. But rare earths mining and processing, as any other extractive industry, um, can be quite environmentally damaging. Um, For example, mining can disrupt the environment, of course, there are potential pollutants and contaminants. Uh, Rare earth processing can also be quite damaging to the environment. Um, There are lots of chemicals that need to go into that stage of the supply chain, and it can also leave behind radioactive waste or, or other waste products that end up getting absorbed into the soil and water. And we see these flashpoints come up most recently in in Greenland, where Position Party actually partially ran on the platform that they were opposing this big rare earths project um, in the country. And elsewhere in Malaysia, there has been kind of popular opposition to this long running popular opposition to this one processing plant uh, for rare earths. So everywhere you do see that kind of opposition, and there are very very valid concerns. But at the same time, we don't have technologies that will completely replace rare earths uh, in batteries and magnets right now. So it looks like rare earths uh, will definitely be playing a really, really important role for at least the years to come. Are we working on those technologies or, and or, I guess, are we working on technologies to recycle rare earths to, to at least make rare earths more sustainable? Yeah, governments and companies are looking to recycle rare earths and um, there are other uh, scientists who are working on replacing rare earths and making rare earth free magnets and batteries. Um, But I think given how much activity we're seeing in the rare earth space right now, it's probably fair to say that rare earths will be kind of sticking around for a good while longer before these other technologies maybe will uh, replace rare earths. Is that something that companies whose products rely on rare earths talk about? If I'm Elon Musk or I'm Tim Cook uh, and my products are heavily reliant on rare earths, am I one, talking about it and two, talking about the sort of environmental impact of those materials at all? Or is it all very, people don't know what they are, so let's not really discuss. Yeah, companies are concerned about this. Um, And, you know, that's, I think, why you see the Apple iPhone 12, I think it is, uh, using 98% recycled rare earths. So you, you do see companies trying to make sure that they can make their products as sustainably as possible. 
there's just so much here, which is just so interesting. Like you've taken something that I never thought about and connected it to uh, geopolitical issues and environmental issues and supply chain issues and all of these things that, that are much larger conversations. And you also know a lot of detail about rare earths in particular. But I want to talk a little bit about those big picture things. What do you think are the big picture implications that you've discovered in, in doing all of this detailed research on rare earths? Yeah, as I've been writing and reading and reporting on rare earths, one thing I often keep in mind is that rare earths really is just one part of a much larger picture, and the much larger picture being how do countries and businesses make sure that they are able to secure this stable and reliable supply of all these critical materials that power the global economy. And rare earths is, is just one part of that. There are lots of other materials that they need to think about, like lithium and cobalt and nickel and even high purity quartz, but I think that might be a whole other podcast where we talk about quartz on a quartz podcast. What about for China? Like, it, it's always fascinating when we get a bit of a glimpse into the way China is approaching its its strategic ambitions. Rare earth sounds like something in that camp. What do you take away from how China is approaching rare earths into how Beijing approaches widespread policy? Yeah, that's the other really interesting part about it, which makes rare earths not just this chemical business story, but also quite political in that it tells us a lot about how China sees itself and positions itself in the global economy. It wants to cement and extend its influence across entire supply chains so that they have influence over entire sectors. They want to kind of extend their influence horizontally across lots of different companies, but also vertically, right? From the upstream to the downstream. And they want to do that across industries, not just rare earths, but also, say, in lithium or other kind of critical materials. So by looking at rare earths, we will get a pretty good idea, I think, of how else they want to use their playbook. You said something at the top that I, that I want to come back to, which is that you got into this topic because it's so quintessentially quartz. And obviously that resonates with me as, as a fellow colleague of yours at quartz. But it was kind of my takeaway. When I started reading your work on rare earths a year ago, I just had this kind of like stoner, like, whoa, moment where you sort of look around the world and think, okay, I'm holding my phone. And you're thinking about the backstory of all of these things. What are all the materials that went into this? Where did they come from? What tensions are they a part of? What are they exposing about the environment? And, and I do think that's a really, um, rare earths are such an interesting case study for that because they are the tiniest thing you can think of, but used in some of the most popular things. But I think the best uh, version of quartz and the best version of your reporting and our reporting is that it's helping you look around the world in your day to day life and seeing things in a totally different light because you've learned all of this uh, not weird, highly relevant, but also perhaps a little bit quirky information um, that connects that thing to the rest of the global economy. And which is all to say, Mary, that you've done a fantastic job of doing that today and sort of drawing those connecting threads. Thanks. Um, I have one last question for you. What is your favorite or most interesting fun fact about rare earths that, that you've come across? Like, I am stuck in an elevator with someone and I'm that person that's going to give them a factoid about rare earths while they're stuck in an elevator with me. What is the factoid or the, the fun fact that I should give them? So here's a fun fact and maybe less usable if you're stuck in the U.S., but if you make it to Europe, um, you can tell someone that actually there is a bit of rare earths in a euro banknote. There is europium in a euro banknote because of its glowiness. Um, it glows under UV light. And so that's actually used for anti-forgery, anti-money laundering purposes. So I thought that was pretty cool that there is rare earths literally kind of sitting in people's wallets and not just their phones. And is it a coincidence that uh, the euro uses europium? I don't know which one came first. Certainly weren't named together, I guess. This <laughs> is a fair conclusion. <laughs> great. Thank you so much for joining me today, Mary. This was great. Thanks for having me. That's our obsession for the week. This episode was produced by Katie Jane Fernelius. Our sound engineer is George Drake, and the theme music is by Taka Yazuzawa and Alex Sukira. Special thanks to reporter Mary Hoy in Hong Kong and editor Alex Osala in New York. If you liked what you heard, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Tell your friends about us, especially the ones addicted to their smartphones. Then head to qz.com slash obsession to sign up for Quartz's weekly obsession email and browse hundreds of interesting backstories. Bye.